you will hear a conversation between a housing agent and a college student who wants to rent a house. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good afternoon and welcome to Habitat Hunters. You must be Joseph. Yes, that's right. You said on the phone that I could come by at two o'clock. Sorry, I'm a little early. No,、oh, no problem at all. In Calgary's market, you have to move fast if you want a good apartment. Actually, I'd settle for almost anything. I've been here ten days and the hotel is ruining me. My father has me on a strict budget. Sit right down here now, sir. Let's talk a little about the places before we go. Have a look. Now we have four apartments available. Okay. Could you tell me more about those four apartments? Sure. The first one is on Beetle Road, just a block off campus. It's a three-bedroom with a bathroom and a living room and a great Italian restaurant right next to it. How much? Well, it's four hundred and thirty-five dollars a month, including internet and utilities. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Any drawbacks to the house? There's a really big garden, but it hasn't been taken care of over the years, and is just too big to clean up nicely. Hmm, that sounds okay. Tell me about the next option. The other three-bedroom apartment is on Oakington Avenue on campus. It is right near the building where you have classes, and the kitchen and living room are newly furnished. Wow, that sounds like a pretty good option. Well, it is a cool apartment, but since it's a dormitory, the living room, bathroom, kitchen, and washing machine are all shared. It would be nice not to have to buy living room furniture, though. And how much is this one? Four hundred dollars per month for a bedroom with an air conditioner. For a bedroom without an air conditioner, you would pay less, three hundred and forty dollars for it. Yikes! Even with the air conditioner, it sounds really inconvenient to have to share facilities. I'll never cook if I have to walk down the hall to use the kitchen. Yeah, that's true. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. Anyway, the next place is a two-bedroom on Mead Street. Oh, I like Mead Street. That's off campus, right? Yep, it's pretty cool, but it only has two bedrooms plus a living room and a study. But I want to live together with my two friends. So you could make the study into a small bedroom if you end up living with them. Also, we guys will want a TV and DVD player since we're all so much into movies. Well, this place has a great TV and VCR, but no DVD player. No DVD? That's so weird. Are any other facilities provided? As you said, weird enough, it also comes with a wash basin. Is there a washing machine? I think we need that more than just a wash basin. I'm afraid there's no washing machine in the apartment. Wow, that's so old-fashioned. Maybe it's not the best choice for three college guys. How much is it? Well, it's six hundred dollars per month, but of course it would be cheaper if you made it into three bedrooms instead of two. Where is the apartment located? It's two five zero zero Mead Street, where there are a lot of bars. It would be affordable, but it would get pretty noisy, and that sounds really expensive for an old place in a noisy area. How about the last place? This one's on campus in the Devon Close complex. It's a one bedroom, so it will be a little quieter than the Mead Street place. One bedroom, huh? That could be good for focusing on my studies. What else does it have? It comes with a living room and a study, and includes a really nice lamp in the study that has a bunch of different settings. You know what else is cool? There's a dining hall downstairs, so all evening meals are free. 
You can purchase breakfast and lunch, but meals after 6 p.m. are free. Wow, this place sounds too good to be true. Is it really expensive? It's all right, $500 per month, but there's no bathroom. What? No bathroom? Well, there's no bathroom in the apartment, but there's one at the end of the hall. Hmm. Thanks. I think now I just have to decide whether I want to live alone or not. Yeah, which one do you prefer? I think I'd choose either this apartment or the one on Beetle Road. OK. a y You'd better think about it and then you can contact me ASAP. Fine. Thanks for your help. You're welcome. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a talk about the waste collection in Baltimore. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi folks, my name is Loretta Johnston and I'm here from the Baltimore Department of Public Waste. Thank you for coming out to our community meeting tonight. I've got a few words to say about the waste collection here in Baltimore. First, there's the sorted collection bins themselves. They're made of sturdy, solid material, so none of your trash can seep out or puncture the bin. Also, since these things sit out on the curb overnight, rain or shine, they have to be waterproof. We can't have water getting up in it and filling up the bin. Remember to pay attention to which bin is which and sort your waste accordingly. You should have a blue or green bin for recyclable garbage, a yellow bin for unrecyclable garbage and a red bin for toxic waste. Our citywide waste management is divided into two services. The first is commercial waste collection or trash collection from buildings. The majority of building waste is paper, which goes in the blue or green bins. You'll notice in your office buildings there are signs that warn you not to overfill these bins. All that paper adds up and an overflowing bin is infinitely harder for collectors to carry to the truck and empty. Aside from paper, Another large source of building waste is metals. Metals such as tin and aluminium can be put in the yellow recycle bins, but metals like lead and copper should be disposed of in the red bins. These heavy metals are harmful to the environment and exacerbate our city's existing pollution problem. That's about all the information you need for building waste. Moving on to the second service, Household waste collection is probably what you primarily think of when you think of what we do here. Many of the same guidelines apply, the sorting is the same, etc. Please remember to keep garbage like kitchen waste in a plastic bag. It makes collection easier and lessens the abominable rotten trash smell. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. So, after we take your trash away, what happens to it? We take all the garbage to one of a number of garbage disposal plants, each of which is located in the middle of an open space of some sort. No one wants to have their home or office right next door to a waste disposal plant, right? Waste is collected 
and then disposed of once every four weeks. A lot of trash can build up in that time, so we're in the process of developing a plan to fund collection more frequently. Ideally, it would be collected weekly, but we will likely have to settle for bi-weekly. The garbage trucks make their rounds to clear the bins at night in order to avoid traffic. I'm sure you've seen how much waste your own household produces in a given week. Now imagine all the trash produced by all the households in Baltimore. It's a lot, right? It may surprise you that this amount is only marginal compared to commercial waste. Yep, the main waste producers are actually businesses, industrial facilities, retail and offices. Hard to believe humans produce that much waste, right? No wonder we have pollution problems. Anyway, after all incoming waste is sorted, recyclables are sent to a recycling plant, while garbage and toxic waste are transported to their respective areas of the plant for treatment. Items such as stones, which should not be disposed of in our bins, are separated out and discarded. Once the trash has undergone the treatment process, it is compacted and disposed of with all the other trash. And finally, when the landfill space is full, it is buried deep underground and in time something new is built on the land. That's everything about waste collection. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Scope Charity Office, how can I help you? Oh, hello. I'm ringing about the Dragon Boat Race that you're asking people to take part in. Oh, yes. We still need a few more teams. Are you interested in joining the race? Yes. We want to enter a team but we don't know anything about it. Could I ask you for some more information first? Of course. I don't even know when it's being held. <laughs> it's taking place on the 2nd of July. Is that a Saturday? No, it's a Sunday. It's a much more popular day and more people can take part then. Right. And where's it being held? At the Brighton Marina. Oh, uh, I'm an overseas student. Could you spell that for me? Yes. It's Brighton Marina. That's M-A-R-I-N-A. -I Do you know where it is? I'm not sure. It's a couple of miles past the Palace Pier. Oh, yes. I know it. You take a right turning off the coast road or you can cycle along the seafront. That's good. What time does the race start? Well... The first heats begin at 10am, but you need to register half an hour before that at 9.30 and we really recommend that you aim to be there by 9. It's a good idea to arrange a meeting place for your team. Right. And the race is to help raise money for charity? It is. We're asking every team member to try and raise £35 by getting friends and or relatives to sponsor them. Every crew member will receive a free tournament T-shirt if your team manages to raise a £1,000 or more. Oh, that's quite good. 
Also, we're holding a raffle. Every crew member who takes part in the race this season will be entered into a free prize draw. Oh, what's the prize? It's pretty good. It's a holiday in Hong Kong. Sounds great. The man asks for more information. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Is there anything else you need to know? Uh, could you just tell me a little bit more about the teams? Well, you need to have a crew of 20 people for your dragon boat and you then need to agree on who's going to be the team captain. That will probably be you. Fine. Um, I've got a group of 20 people who are interested. Uh, do all the team members have to be a certain age? Well, there's no age limit as such, but if you have a team member who's under 18, then they have to get their parents' permission to take part. Yes, that makes sense. It isn't dangerous, but we do have boats that turn over in the water, and for that reason we need to insist that everyone wears a life jacket as well. And you can hire life jackets from us when your team arrives. What do you advise people to wear? Well, most people wear a t-shirt, shorts and trainers. I certainly wouldn't recommend that you wear jeans or boots. In fact, it's a very good idea to bring some spare clothes. OK. It can get quite cold and wet if the weather's bad. And there's quite a bit of hanging around, especially if you qualify for the semi-finals or the final. I see what you mean. Have you got a name for your team? Oh, not yet, no. Well, you need to decide on one and then put it on the entrance form, which I'll send you. Oh, OK. So, if you'd like to give me your address, I'll be happy to send details first class. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about trumpets. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The trumpet is quite a remarkable instrument. Take the B-flat type, for instance, the kind of trumpet most people use today. If we stretched one out in a straight line, it would measure nearly 140 centimeters in length. What we see in the diagram, then, is a very long brass tube wrapped around itself in order to save space. To produce its characteristic sound, the musician blows continuously into the small metal cup on the left, called the mouthpiece, which is shaped to fit the lips. The air travels along the lead pipe and round the tuning slide, which can be moved in or out to change the instrument's pitch. The air then reaches the feature that distinguishes the trumpet from, for instance, a bugle, the three valves that extend from above the top to below the bottom of the instrument. 
Each valve can send the airflow one of two ways, either along the main pipe, the shortest route, or else into an extra length of tube, thus lowering the pitch of the sound being played. The musician does this by pressing one of the finger buttons at the top, diverting the air into the first tube if the first is pressed, into the second and shortest by using the second, or into the longest one, the third, by pressing number three. The air then continues its way round the bend in the lead pipe and along to the end at the widest part of the body, known as the bell, which projects the powerful sound forwards. Incidentally, all this breath forced through the metal of the instrument does of course contain water vapor, and this will start to condense and form droplets after a certain amount of playing. The result is a gurgling sound from the trumpet, so to avoid this, there is a device on the tuning slide called the water key, which when pressed lets the water drip out. The trumpet in one form or another has been around for a long time. The earliest type we have actual proof of was a short straight instrument used with marching soldiers by the ancient Egyptians' 18th dynasty, which makes it 3,500 years old, although other cultures in China and Peru certainly had something similar very early on. This use of the trumpet in military contexts, as well as at ceremonial occasions, was to continue through the times of the ancient Greeks and Romans, but it wasn't until the 17th century that it became a genuinely popular instrument, at least in the West. At the beginning of the 18th century, it was finally accepted as part of the typical orchestra, and the addition of valves in the 19th century, making it much more versatile, consolidated its position as a major orchestral instrument. Nowadays, the sound of the trumpet, which is of course both loud and clear, means that for many pieces it is used to lead the brass section of the orchestra. This sound and its versatility have helped extend its use to other forms of music, such as jazz and pop, but there is another very practical reason for its widespread popularity. In comparison with many others, such as the tuba, the cello, or even the trombone, it is a fairly small instrument that can easily be transported and played just about anywhere. The downside of all this popularity, though, is that as everyone wants to be a trumpeter, it can be difficult for the young musician looking for work to find a vacancy. As a result, it's often the case that quite a few of the French horn players in a modern orchestra actually began their musical careers as trumpet players. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Fame from the people who deceive me Muddy hands break through the chains, go free me People like sheep move feet, hurt it easy You don't wanna be fast asleep when they ski me Better stand tall, ready for a fight, believe me When they try the chains, you can say no, free me so he's been looking for somebody who could save him Instead of searching inside for what they gave him A strong will, strong mind causes mayhem We could change the world, change times, rearrange them Staying on pace